The modern prejudice that medieval or Renaissance close combat skill was based on little more than heavy weapons and strong blows lacking any larger art is largely the result of ignorance by 18th and 19th century fencing masters and fencing writers. Their views were accepted uncritically by their 20th century heirs and modern popular culture has reinforced this ignorance. Though well documented at the time in numerous volumes, as their purpose decayed, the personal close combat teachings from the Middle Ages and Renaissance eventually altered, atrophied, or became extinct. Due to changing historical and social forces, the traditional martial teachings of European masters of defense fell out of common use. Little to nothing of their methods actually survive in modern fencing sports today, which, based largely on conceptions of 18th century small sword dueling, are far removed from their martial origins in the late Renaissance. By the early 18th century, the vast array of traditional arms and armor as well as fencing with long double-handed cutting blades for battlefield, duel, or close quarter self-defense were already all but obsolete. No fencing style based directly upon earlier medieval and renaissance cut and thrust swordplay survived. Of the once rich tradition of sophisticated Renaissance martial arts, they grew first irrelevant, then obsolete, quickly atrophied, and finally became almost wholly extinct. There was no retention of any pedagogic method of instruction, no surviving manner of class lessons, or even a preserved theory of living practice. How then were the martial arts of Renaissance Europe lost? They were lost as the unarmed component was discarded from later fencing styles, while the armed component was dropped from Western wrestling teachings. Once the need of dealing with sudden lethal violence no longer compels the two skill sets be integrated, the craft turns from an all-inclusive martial art of all-out fighting to simple ritual combative and martial sport. Once the vital attitude of pragmatic fighting skill evaporates, there is also no longer any need for a martial spirit of close combat warrior ethics. Undergoing a process of civilianization, ritualization, and sportification, these disciplines faded into obsolescence to eventually suffer theatricalization and finally endure mere recreationalization. Unlike other aspects of military history, whereby weaponry and methods of fighting improve with every generation of advancement, the story of swordsmanship ultimately did not follow such an evolution. The hand-to-hand -hand combat environment was dramatically altered by firearms, such that later methods of swords and sword play were not readily faced with the same kinds of dangers and challenges as occurred in the past. Thus they did not progress into superior forms over that of their ancestors, so much as morph into different breeds adapted to another setting. Instead, the foining fence of the civilian small sword for single combat, descended from the 17th century dueling rapier, provided the instructional foundation for nearly all European fencing to follow. Elements of poise, comportment, and refined grace, having little to do with self-defense, also became an important etiquette of swordplay. But for some 300 years now, modern masters of arms and academies of fencing have not been concerned with preserving these past fighting methods, let alone retaining the forgotten methods of obsolete combat systems. No surviving legacy of teaching Renaissance arms was preserved within any modern schools of fencing, nor passed on to any modern fencing master. There is no one alive today who was trained in these lost fighting arts by an expert, who was themselves trained by an expert, who had been trained by an expert, who was trained by an expert, going back in an unbroken line to the Renaissance. 
As the art changed down through the centuries, the intervening generations severed the connections. Thus, the very reason why these skills now have to be reclaimed is because the fencers of later centuries came to first generally disregard, then wholly abandon them. Modern European fencing styles themselves, even similar cut-and-thrust versions, are largely post-Renaissance in origin, with little to no connection to far older, more inclusive, yet extinct martial systems. Even classical fencing instruction today is not, and has never been, a repository for teaching these earlier self-defense skills, skills which are only now at last beginning to be systematically investigated and reconstructed. The Renaissance warrior skills of double-handed sword, of sword and dagger or buckler, of spear and halberd, of trapping and grappling were long gone. Once integrated fighting methods were reduced down to mere single-handed styles of swordplay, allowing no body-to-body -body contact. The previously systematic fighting disciplines of diverse weapons and sophisticated unarmed self-defense techniques in Western Europe ultimately deteriorated into what was to become a competitive mock dueling sport. This is the very reason today they must be reconstructed and reestablished from the historical source literature. Even as Western ways of warfare transformed through the ages with the evolution of military technology, we can trace a consistency in the approach to personal martial skill. Whether as ancient citizen soldier, dark age warrior, feudal knight, or renaissance man at arms, this legacy faded only as older ways of fighting with traditional arms and armor died out. The little-known history of the subject forms an important part of a more than 2,500-year military tradition of close combat proficiency within Western civilization. There is no question that fencing changed and evolved over time. It is the manner by which it changed and the degree to which it changed that is the debate. But the fact Renaissance martial arts themselves were lost is not in question. The new question now is, how can they best be revived?